and welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage here at RSA. We are in beautiful, sunny downtown San Francisco, and I am here today with Anubhav Arora, the Vice President of Security Engineering at Cradle Point. Welcome, I'm so Thank glad you. to have you. Very glad to be here. Absolutely, well we were just sitting here talking about how the job that we have when we show up at industry trade shows, especially one as big as this one, is actually a really big job. Yes. And, but the cool thing, I think, is that you know, we get FaceTime with our customers, with our partners, with our analyst friends. You know, yes. I mean, it, it really is, I think, an important... Um, it's an important step yeah. in our journeys towards making the world secure. Absolutely, absolutely. So, we're going to talk today about 5G, yeah. and we're going to talk about the increased adoption of 5G as a wireless WAN technology. It changes everything, what, what we know about traditional networking, and, and it, but it brings in you know, increased risks, um, all different kinds of things. And, and so what has to happen, of course, is that technology has to evolve to support these changes, right? Yes. And so, um, is zero trust the answer? Yes. Is Sassy the answer? Yes. <laughs> so, so, but today I want to talk a little bit about secure 5G environments and yes. kind of your thinking in terms, I mean, you know, you're the VP of security and engineering, right? So you, I think you have some thoughts on this topic. So I'd love to talk some more about just kind of what organizations need to be thinking about when they're approaching this. Yep. It's a very fine point and uh, 5G, cellular in particular, and 5G bringing us more bandwidth, unlimited data plans. What is it really doing to our networks? It's allowing us to add more use cases. It's allowing us to add remote sites, remote workers, remote IoT devices. It's allowing us to expand the networks at a rapid pace, at a pace that the agile enterprises actually want to do that. It brings the challenges of security because devices themselves that we place on the network can be a security risk. And the more devices we put on our networks, the more manufacturers, the more vendors, the more patching systems we are putting on our networks. So how do you actually create a network that automatically takes care of most of those risks in a manner that access to these devices, access from these devices, communication patterns that are restricted or understood to be threatening are not allowed, those are the challenges that we face when we actually go into the 5G world and cellular world enabling these use cases and the security that comes with it. So this enterprise's security is the backbone of their network. Security is the first conversation. Security is the most paramount um, part of a network design. Right. Is zero trust the answer? Absolutely. Zero <laughs> trust is the answer, why? Implemented correctly, zero trust actually starts to take away all of these threat attack surfaces. Right. How do you actually get these attacks in? How does an attacker get in? It's because we have an attack surface. Attack surface means places where an attacker might get a foothold and then hop to another part of the network, yeah. hop to another part of the network. So there is an attack surface on the external side right. on how to get in. There is an attack surface on the internal side, how to hop to another part of the network, another resource, another data uh, base, or another part, of the net, uh, another part of the network where you can get access to more data. All of that is eliminated almost completely by a zero trust network. Right. And that depends on the design with zero trust principles. So as we put more devices with 5G on the networks, it's paramount that the security is considered first and zero trust is the architecture of choice to design the network with. Yeah. SASE, while we use SASE and zero trust in the same breath, in the same sentence most of the time, they are slightly different. One yeah. is an architecture, the other is a product category. But a lot of SASE vendors do take pride in constructing their solutions with Zero Trust, and so do we at Cradle Point. We construct our NetCloud SASE solution completely from Zero Trust principles ground right. up. But that's not necessarily the case for every, every network or every vendor. So it's, as, as people are thinking about constructing their networks, constructing their SASE, choosing their SASE vendors, putting their basic tenets into place, who can access what, what kind of policies, what kind of openings we have allowing in our network. It's important to understand both yeah. Zero Trust and how SASE vendors are building their networks with Zero yeah. Trust. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So, you know, I think that a lot of times when we talk about 
5G and we talk about devices, you know, the, the reality of it is, this ecosystem is mm -hmm. so big mm -hmm. and it's expanding at such a rapid pace and I think that the ordinary average people don't really realize yes. the number of endpoint vulnerabilities out there, you know, yes. walk into a hospital, walk into your doctor's yeah. office, your critical infrastructure, your, you know, our homes are yeah. filled Absolutely. with sensors and things like routers and printers and Absolutely. things that, you know, I mean, so we don't think about the risk that's associated with that, but, and then when you extrapolate that out to at the enterprise level and the risk that's associated with that, so, so it's really interesting to me, and it's and I want you know one of the things that I say when we have these conversations is that if you think there's a lot of, of things connected to the internet today, you I mean you, blink yeah. because tomorrow it's going to double and then the exactly <laughs> they'll double again exactly so it so it really is interesting times. I want to talk a little bit now about 5G as a WAN technology, mm -hmm. and really I know that this is a place that you know Cradle yeah. Point really plays in. So talk with me a little bit about that if you would. So 5G is a very very uh, high bandwidth WAN technology, very secure in its own construction. So if you look at 5G as a source of identity, 5G as a RAN radio network where what happens on the radio is, is secured and how, and 5G also as a cloud-based management system where all of the protocols that run in the 5G system are actually running in the cloud in a cloud native manner. If you look at 5G itself, it's a very secure cellular technology. So 5G as a van is a very secure cellular technology and the challenge really is to make sure that, two parts, that you can provide the right quality of experience to the applications that are behind 5G. So if you're streaming video over your phone, one phone, that's okay, but what if you're using more um, distributed nature of 5G where you have lots of cameras across the world and all those cameras are using 5G to up to up, upload their video streams. Right. You now need a predictable behavior of the bandwidth. You now need an application-centric SD-WAN which is taking care of the nature of 5G at, at, at heart, which is cellular at heart can be unpredictable because of mobility, because of other signal strength issues, and you need to be able to make sure that the priority for your business critical applications is there. So the quality of experience for business critical applications over cellular is what we take pride in providing with our solutions at Cradle Point, whether it's our wireless WAN as well as our NetCloud SASE. Um, the second part becomes security in that construct. So the security is, is dual edged. First, how do you join a network like a 5G network? You join it because you have the authoritative credentials to be able to join it with a SIM card and it's very, it's impossible to spoof or to actually take care of, um, you know, hack a SIM card and in that sense for right. 5G. So 5G allows us to use identity itself as an element of policy and allows us to use the network identity of 5G as an element of policy that we use to access, to allow access for who can, act, who can do what on the network. And the last part about it is, behind 5G can be multiple devices. We ourselves have routers, and in each router, behind a 5G right. router, you can have IoT devices. IoT is a very big use case for us. IoT devices are challenging, as you know. IoT devices, we have a lot of them in our homes, each one of them is different. They don't come with central palace management. They don't come with, you know, they don't come with their, they come with their own challenges <laughs> of security risks. So how do you? They come, they come with passwords that are preset. Preset that passwords. Users don't ever change. Preset passwords. <laughs> and you won't even, you won't, you would not have an access to an, uh, you have access to your computer, you can go into your firewall, turn it on, you have access to management from your administrative side on yeah. your computer, you can restrict certain things. With IoT, you can't really do that. You can't put a host agent, you cannot look inside. You, it's very hard to understand the concept in, from, an, from a layman's perspective because IoT devices behave in a really quite different manner. Right. So once you put an IoT device on the network, it's important to understand how will you provide access to the device and what will you let the device access outside. Mm -hmm. And if you do that with the right manner, with the right zero trust principles, that only authoritative access when authenticated it can come in, and even that through an isolation plane so that you cannot upload things. Right. And 
you can also do um, restriction of where the IoT device can go and access in the internet, as well as not expose any ports so that you are never actually doing any kind of uh, uh, exposure of the IoT device to the internet, right. and micro-segmentation so that even if there is some kind of uh, compromise, there is no movement to another right. part of the network. If you do it, with, and those are all zero trust principles, each one of them, right. each one of them. And if you do it right, you can actually create the right network. You can actually put the right devices with 5G on the network, and on corporate network, and use your capability, use your use cases, and enable those use cases in the right manner. So what we do at NetLoud SASE is to do all of these things. The right quality of experience for the applications, the right administrative or privileged access to the IoT devices, the right segmentation and micro-segmentation going in and out from the devices to make sure that we have the right constructs for security. Yeah. Yeah, it, it makes perfect sense. I actually spent some time with uh, Camille Campbell taught from your team talking about yep. the, when the when the news of the NetCloud Net yep. SASE came out. So she's amazing and really exciting technology yep. solution and all that. So, so when organizations are considering securing their 5G environments, I know the answer to this, you know, part of the question is, should their starting point be zero trust environments? Yes. <laughs> yes. Should it be sassy? Yes. But I'm thinking it probably needs to be both. So talk with me about yes. how we make that happen. Yep. Zero trust in general is an architecture and more of a journey. Yes. CISA actually has a document which is about the maturity model towards zero trust and it defines the organization's journey in adoption of zero trust. Right. So zero trust is not something you can get to in a day one, yeah. especially a, in a transformation. It's a principle. It's a principle. It's a, it is, yeah, yes. Especially when you're changing your network. Yeah. So in, in the, the most important part is to start and iteratively move towards next steps. And the next steps are sometimes not obvious, sometimes that you need to learn through what's happening on your network, you need to use the visibility given by your vendors in your network to create the right policy. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's important that you find your policy through action, like you actually disable something and then you find what might actually happen through there, so you test certain things out. So the vendors that provide zero trust based SASE not only with the right foundational principles, but also in a way that they allow you to get to a zero trust architecture in a mature manner. Not just that you lock down everything day one, but you actually start and you repeatedly understand what's happening on your network and you create the right policy yep. to lock it down further and further and further. So that one day you get to deny all except what is authorized kind of posture, that is the right answer. Yeah. Some parts of zero trust you can actually put in through the architecture, the rest are through policy and the maturity in the policy is where the, the platform should be able to give you all the visibility, give you all the data that you need to see what's happening on your network so you can iterate towards the right deny all policy. So, SASE and Zero Trust, both are the answer in, in every which way, but a vendor that produces a SASE stack with Zero Trust principles and allows an organization to move to Zero Trust architecture with maturity, or go ongoing maturity, is the right choice. And we strive to do that at NetCloud SASE. So we strive to, strive to give both of these options. We are built with Zero Trust and we allow you to actually mature your own posture towards Zero Trust as you, um, as you understand your network better. You know, Zero Trust is not a new concept. Nope. It's not. I mean, we've been talking about this for a long time, but I do think there is a hype factor. Yep. And there's also, you know, in every situation, you always have people who kind of glom on to a phrase or an industry buzzword or whatever, you know where I'm going with this. Yep. Um, but, you know, how do you, how do you differentiate yep. between the hype and, you know, if you're a customer, yep. Right, and you know yep. that you know enough about zero trust to be dangerous. Yes. Okay. You know that it's important, and yes. you know that you want to embrace it. How do you avoid um, having? How do you avoid picking a vendor who's really just just hype? You know, how, how, what do you look for? Yeah. So um, zero trust, like you said, is not new. It's a set of principles, and I liken a lot of this to what you might do in your own home. If you, 
if you have a situation in your home where you have to keep yourself safe, what will you first do? You will first lock your doors, lock your windows, right? Permissioning. You, yeah, <laughs> and you would, you, you would make sure that the basics are that no one can get in. Yeah. Right, and then if you might have a situation where you can imagine somebody could get in, you would start putting some kind of detection algorithms to make sure that if they do get in, you would detect that. It's the same principles with credit card fraud or any other fraud, you first don't want it to happen. Right. Second, if it does happen, which it can, you want to detect it. So the strictness of implementation of zero trust in it is about how strict do you never let it happen how dark your situation is so that people do not know about the existence of a certain resource until they have a reason to know. So when we explore a vendor and you want to understand how Zero Trust is implemented, you need to ask the right questions around what is visible to those who do not have access? What is visible from an outside attack surface? What is visible if a certain device is compromised? What if I, my credentials are compromised or my iPad is compromised and I go to the Wi-Fi? What can I see? What can I do? And how much of it is invisible to start with or deny all? So the invisible part or the deny part is really critical and the granularity is with which it is implemented and the the invisible part makes it invisible to an attacker to even try and find an exploit. Even if they are not authenticated, they can't even see the resource. So all of those pieces are important to understand in a little bit of technical detail to understand what zero trust implementation is behind the scenes yeah. and how it makes the system hack, hack proof or attack proof and starts with that principle. A lot of attacks start with phishing. How do you deal with phishing? A lot of attacks start with an exploit coming in from a website. How do you deal with that? A lot of attacks start with an upload of an attachment or something. How do you deal with that? A lot of attacks might be because you have ports open on the internet or the ex devices exposed on the internet. How do you deal with that? So a lot of these questions and set of these is what you need to start with. And the answer should be this situation is impossible because of a prevention-based situation built into it. And once you build a prevention-based situation, you prevent as much as possible, you, you, you have the attack surface as minimal as possible from an external and internal places. The next is, I need to see whatever else is happening on my network, who's accessing what. And using that, with the human element and the technology element to detect anomalies, to detect credentials that might be compromised, to yeah. detect assets that might be compromised, because attacks can still proceed even after all the lockdown. So, zero trust is important, but the implementation of zero trust is even more important, yeah. and the right questions lead you to those answers in detail. I knew I could count on you to give me those answers, so thank you for that. So let's talk about applying a zero trust approach to mm -hmm. web security. So this is for users who are connecting to the internet through 5G, yep. of course that number will continue to grow. Yep. What kind of things do people need to keep in mind? So web security is special because um, the internet is broad, very big, and a lot of delivery of malware, delivery of phishing is through web security. Yep. As we browse a website, we are trusting our browser to be doing everything safely. However, a browser and the number of lines in a browser today is almost as much as any kind of operating system. Yeah. So a browser is a very complex application and pages today are not simple HTML with images and small JavaScript, they're complex applications. Right. So when we're looking at a website, we're actually looking at an application and we're using almost an entire operating system worth of code to do that. When we do that, we are exposed to risks out there in the internet and the safest way to make sure that the risks are not there is to use what we call the remote browser isolation technology and that allows you to run all of this code in a remote browser, a disposable remote browser in the cloud and see a stream of it just like if you're connecting an HDMI cable to your computer to your TV and on the TV there, there's nothing being run, it's just a pixel stream while your computer is running all the code. Is that that's what our remote browser isolation technology does. So what that does is that it allows the remote browser to inherit the risks, if any, 
find them and then put a s simple safe stream over to the local browser and that safeguards your users from web-borne threats. Yeah. You should be doing that for any kind of untrustable, badly reputable uh, websites, yeah. anything that is for sure known to be badly reputable or new or uncategorized, we need to run that kind of isolation technology and doing it in a way that the user experience is seamless, you can still click on things, you can still you know, scroll fast, and your experience as a user to browse the web page is not interrupted. Okay, well I think that's incredibly important, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean if you're going to get people to use these things, you have, that's the you thing. Have, you have to be very sensitive you know, to that You part. have yes. to, and I, I was having a conversation with somebody the other day, a, a supply chain expert from Schneider Electric, and she was talking a little bit about, you know, I have this closed down, and this closed down, and this closed down, and that's great, yeah. but the challenge then becomes, ordinary average users within the organization, you don't want to frustrate them. Can they them. do their work? Yeah, Can they, they, do their they work? need to be yeah. able to do their work. Yeah. So speaking of being able to do your work, I know there's an increasing demand for secure, optimized 5G networks. Yes. So talk with me a little bit about how CradlePoint's delivering that for customers. Yeah, absolutely. So as 5G and cellular use cases expand the devices, it's important to consider the enterprise framework in which all of these devices, all of these cellular connectivity is put within a, a network that allows the right policies for the users, for the devices, for the data, and all of this to cross-connect only when needed, only when authorized, and only when authenticated, and deny everything else. Right? Yeah. And, do, and in certain cases, you evaluate the risk, like when you are going out to a certain website, you put isolation technology on there. While we do this as the part of security, it's important to do quality of experience like we were just discussing. So when you're behind a cellular use case and you cannot connect your application correctly, when you cannot do um, video streaming correctly, that becomes a business problem, that's sure. a business issue. So CradlePoint is a wireless WAN company. Our SD-WAN solutions have always been about cellular optimization, so 5G SASE that we introduced lately with our NetCloud SASE solution, it has multiple optimizations for making sure that the quality of experience for business critical applications over cellular is maintained. We have multiple innovative um, technologies in place to be able to do so. And we also make sure that the security on that network is zero trust, as we were just talking about. Yeah. Zero trust architecture, um, use of SIM identity as, as, as something that we can evaluate as a policy element, so SIM identity becomes an authoritative policy element in, our, uh, in, in the NetCloud SASE, as well as maintaining quality of experience for business critical applications. That's yeah. what we are set out to do. Well, and you know, I think that the thing that a lot of times people don't think about when it comes to cellular access and mission critical situations. I mean, we have first responders yep. out there. We have yep. people who are working in the field yep. on oil rigs, yep. on you know all different kinds of uh, yep. dangerous situations and yep. that sort of thing. So this is really, a, this really kind important. of connectivity, like we can't not be connected when you're doing these certain kind and, of things. And security because attackers don't care like you have yeah. seen here. They, they, don't care. they don't care. They don't care where their money comes from, their ransom comes from, whether it comes from a hospital or a mission critical system, they don't care. <laughs> so, but we have to. That we have to, yeah, we and it's to. well, it's a you know the conversations that we've been having around this event is that you know it's an exciting time for yes. those of us who are practitioners in this space in one way or another. Uh, you might also call it a frightening time. Um, you know, the, the, there there is no option to do nothing no as it relates to, to all of the things that we're talking about. Yep. So, um, Anubhav Arora, Vice President of Security Engineering at Cradlepoint, thank you so much for spending time with me today. Thank you. I knew this was going to be a great conversation and for our listening and viewing audience, we are coming to you live from RSA in San Francisco, the security event of the year. I'm Shelley Kramer with theCUBE. I'm here with Dave Valente and David Linthicum. Keep it right here on theCUBE and we'll see you for some more here in a little bit. Yeah.